Hi everyone. In our last Zoom session, um, I dealt with jurisdiction form and proper law, and I wanted to clarify a couple of points, and all I think I did was wind up scaring you. Um, the material that I posted um, is totally correct, um, but I, I don't think it's very clear, and it was intended to um, provide you a guide for use in the uh, midterm exam if necessary. And... Um, so what I want to do here is I want to actually delete that and come up with a simplified version which you can use as a guide on the exam because I don't want to create lawyers. I want business people to understand um, how the law is applied in a situation like this. Um, so what was wrong? Well, vesting rights was the way that they used to determine um, where you could take jurisdiction in a tort case. The courts have moved away from that. They apply the... Um, uh, real and substantial connection doctrine. Okay. And the other thing was, um, I have done international court trials, but jurisdiction was never the issue. And so I always assumed that you would go forum, jurisdiction, and law. In fact, you go jurisdiction and forum generally follows that, and then you look to see what the proper law is. So the, the document that I've now posted really takes that approach. Um, and the first step is that jurisdiction may not be an issue at all. In Sharn importing, for example, um, it was not an issue because the foreign litigant, um, Sharn importing, a Quebec company, started the lawsuit in British Columbia and so was a torning, meaning agreeing to that being the jurisdiction. And of course, Babchuk was a BC resident, so jurisdiction isn't a problem. Um, however, that isn't always the case. And so if the foreign litigant has not attorned to the jurisdiction of the court, then the first thing a BC court would have to de determine is um, whether this is um, something that is uh, taking place in BC or um, another jurisdiction. Okay, so um, that's because a BC court can look at it and can we take jurisdiction in BC, but if it's obviously an Ontario lawsuit, then... Um, then uh, you know they, they'll decline to take jurisdiction. So <clears throat> if, if it's occurring in BC, then go to step three. We have a statute. The statute regulates it. So you go to the statute and you don't worry about case law. Uh, this is with respect to jurisdiction. The statute is a court jurisdiction and proceedings transfer act. Okay, so you look to the contract. You always look to the contract between the parties. If there is a jurisdiction clause in the contract, then the problem is basically solved. So I've given you two examples. One, uh, uh, clause 22 of a contract saying governing law. And it says, um, this agreement shall be made in and construed in accordance to the laws of the province of British Columbia and the parties are torn to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Bingo. Problem solved. The court can take jurisdiction. However, if there's a clause and the other one that is there reads, uh, this agreement shall be made and construed in accordance to the laws of the province of Ontario and the parties are torn to the jurisdiction of the Superior Court. So the BC Court says, okay, no, there's a, 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 jur a jurisdiction selection clause. Um, we decline. You have to go to Ontario to do battle. Um, however, if there is no express term in the contract or if this is a tort matter so there is no contract, then you have to go to step five. Step five says, what type of dispute is it? Is it a contractual matter or an enforcement of a judgment matter or is it a tort matter? Okay, so let's look at tort first of all. Tort is an injury caused through negligence or, um, uh, or the actions of another person like battery or false imprisonment, things like that. Was the tort committed in BC? If so, then section 10G um, allows the BC court to take jurisdiction. But what happens if the court, uh, if the um, uh, injury took place in Japan or uh, Buenos Aires? Um, well, <clears throat> then the court cannot take jurisdiction based on section 10 sub G. What they do is they say, okay, that tort, did it come from a contract? So in other words, did a tour company um, in BC sell you a tour and then you went on the tour and got injured. 
Okay, so the tort occurred somewhere else, but the contract was in BC. And so the courts could then take jurisdiction based on Section 10H, right? So that's torts, straightforward. A contract dispute um, <clears throat> with a substantial connection to BC. In other words, one of the parties has got to be from BC. Bingo. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the court can take jurisdiction based on Section 10 sub I, okay, uh, 10E sub I. But if not, okay, then you go to step eight. If the dispute involved an attempt, uh, uh, so it's not a tort and it's not a contract matter, it's a foreign judgment creditor trying to collect money in BC from a judgment obtained elsewhere. Okay, that's the third way, uh, type of issue. Um, then the courts can take uh, jurisdiction based on section 10K, all right? Okay, if the dispute involves an oh, pardon me, um, if none of those three scenarios apply, but justice cries out for the matter to be heard in BC, and um, I'll give you an example. Um, the omnipotent court of Bajanajistan should be the court of jurisdiction, but the person that is defending is a Bajanajistanian and it's pretty much guaranteed that the court case is going to decide in favor of the Bajanajistanian. Then you may be able to say, um, <clears throat> uh, no, BC should be the jurisdiction. Well, um, on what basis? Because the statute outlines the, how you can take jurisdiction. Well, the statute says that the provisions of the statute are not exhaustive, that, hey, listen, we're not omnipotent. We can't figure out every particular scenario. So there may be some situation where um, <clears throat> you should be able to take jurisdiction, even though we haven't itemized it. And you can see that in the words of the statute, which you've got in the material. And it says, without limiting the right of the plaintiff to prove other circumstances that constitute a real and substantial connection between British Columbia and the facts on which the proceeding is based. So in other words, the legislature, the you know the government said, um, "Hey, listen, we're, you know we can, we can't anticipate everything, so there may be other situations, and you can do it." All right. Um, <clears throat> so that's step nine. Um, if the issue in dispute is raised in Ontario, for example, and, and that probably will not occur on the exam because I can't imagine I want to start getting you to apply the uh, rules of civil court there. Um, but if, if that happened in um, Ontario, well, um, the, um, our statute allows, you know, for these other exhaustive or um, other possibilities to come up. The um, Ontario rules of court don't do that, okay? They just say you can take jurisdiction in these matters, and then they're silent. But in Ontario, the Club Resort uh, Limited versus Van Breda case, um, the Supreme Court of Canada said, well, the rules are not exhaustive. There could be other ways. Okay, so they get to the same same result, just in a different way. BC is substantive law. Okay, the rules of court are procedural law in Ontario, but they intend to take jurisdiction, and we wind up in the same place. Okay, that's jurisdiction. Um, if there's questions on the exam, they will fit into one of those categories, and then you just have to explain the process. Forum. Forum generally follows jurisdiction. Once the BC Supreme Court has taken jurisdiction, well, gosh golly gee, it should be the forum, right? There are only two situations that we have to worry about where this isn't particularly the case. Um, and one is, is there a clause in the contract which states the forum is different than the BC Supreme Court. And I've given you a clause, and it's a med-arb clause. Um, all disputes arising out of in connection with this contract or in respect of defined legal relationships, blah, 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 shall be referred to final and binding arbitration under the international commercial arbitration rules of the pro uh, of procedure in the British Columbia International Commercial Arbitration Center. Where's the center? It's in Vancouver. So that's got to be the forum, 
because the parties have agreed to it. <coughs> um, and so what, what's, the, uh, what's the court do? Oh, okay, we don't have jurisdiction. No, they don't. They say, okay, we have jurisdiction because this is a BC party, the parties of a, um, uh, or a BC contract, and the parties have a torn to the uh, jurisdiction of the court through the, um, the statute. Um, but hey, we're not the forum. So we have jurisdiction, but we're not the forum. Well, what do they do in a situation like that? What they do is they say, okay, we have jurisdiction subject to the matter being, being taken care of by arbitration. So in other words, if the parties do go to arbitration and if the dispute is settled, the court has nothing to do with it. But if for some reason one of the parties refuses to go to arbitration or stops the arbitration process in some way, then it goes back to court because they have jurisdiction. Okay? All right. That's one way. <clears throat> if there's an ADR clause that says the forum is elsewhere. <coughs> Pardon me. Allergies. Ooh. Um, the, uh, the other way is forum nonconvenience. Okay? Yes, the BC court has jurisdiction. But most of the witnesses, and gosh, the subject matter, are all in um, Chile. So BC has jurisdiction, but maybe it would be better argued and fought in Chile. One of the parties is from Chile, the witnesses are from Chile, the property is from Chile, and it's only the plaintiff that is from BC. So plaintiff, forum nonconvenience, go to Chile. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Anyway, um... <clears throat> the uh, uh, there's a court case um, that says just because it's convenient to do it somewhere else doesn't mean form non convenience applies um, unless it's more convenient convenient okay all right and that's all you have to know about form proper law the proper law is the law which should be applied to determine the merits of the legal dispute and we went through that in an exhaustive fashion in going over the Sharn importing LTD versus Babchuk case. Uh, the first thing the courts do, again, there's a step to the process. So we have jurisdiction. Let's say we took jurisdiction automatically. Okay. But we have to figure out the law, which is what happened in Babchuk. Uh, look to the contract. Is there an express clause? Okay. Well, if you look back at those uh, clauses that we dealt with for um, um, <coughs> uh, jurisdiction, uh, this agreement shall be made and construed in accordance to the laws of the province of British Columbia. Oh, well, bingo, bango, bong. You know what the law should be. So, check the contract. Um, <clears throat> if there is no, uh, if there's an express choice law clause, it's done. If there's no clause, then you go to step two. Look to the whole of the contract, which is what happened in Sharn Importing. The judge wanted to cut off any possibility of an appeal and so what he said was, obviously, there is um, a nexus and um, the most significant relationship doctrine de uh, uh, indicates that this should be the law of, of BC. Um, <clears throat> uh, but he went on to say, and when you think about it, two people that are negotiating a contract aren't going to say, let's say the law of our Alberta applies where the contract will be null and void because <laughs> you want the contract to work. And so what he did was he said the whole tone of the contract says that um, uh, what the law should be. And, and, you know, I said the law of BC, but in actual fact, in that case, the whole tone of the contract said Quebec law should be applied. Um, so uh, you look to the whole contract. But if the contract doesn't, say indirectly in some way that some other law should apply, then they go to the looking for the nexus or connection. So that's step three, and we've gone through this. Um, the judge looks to see uh, where the place of contracting was, where the place of negotiation was, where the place of performance was, where's the subject matter located, what's the nationality, domicile, or residence of the parties. If uh, the parties are corporations, where were they incorporated? Okay, so they look for that nexus, that connecting factor. And uh, in Sharn Importing, um, they looked at that and they said, well, okay, um, it's not the contract of purchase and sale of the shoes. 
it's a contract of guarantee and um, where would that be performed? Well, that would be performed in Quebec, okay? Um, and so they determined, or the judge determined that Quebec law should apply, okay? So, step four. If the proper law of that <clears throat> um, is that of a foreign jurisdiction, the judge says, okay, lawyers, prove the law. Okay, in other words, what aspect of the Quebec Civil Code would apply to this problem and how should it work? Okay, unfortunately, both were common law lawyers. They knew nothing about the Quebec Civil Code. And so they sort of looked at each other and went, I don't know. At which point the judge goes to step five. Okay, if the court cannot determine or if the lawyers cannot determine prove the law of Quebec, then the court is allowed to apply any law it wants. And gosh, why would they apply the law of, you know, the Duchy of Grand Fenwick? Obviously, the judge is going to apply the law of BC, which is what they did. Okay, so <clears throat> look to see if the problem relates to jurisdiction. If it does, you go through the steps of the above. Look to see if they've taken jurisdiction, but the form is in question. Then you go to the forum section and look to see if the issue on the exam is relates to um, the uh, uh, the proper law in which case you go through those steps bring that in with you apply it if necessary um, <clears throat> and um, I've provided you the statutory provisions just because I want to teach you more than I will actually test you on all right so obviously the important statute is the court jurisdiction and proceedings transfer act and um, the uh, uh, sections that you should uh, uh, look at are, are there. I put down the rules of civil procedure for Ontario just so that you can see the contrast between substantive law and, and uh, procedural law. Um, and actually, that would make a good uh, uh, exam question. Okay, um, that's it. What I plan to do is I plan to put um, a couple of practice problems um, if I if I have enough time and get them on to uh, e-learn and you can go through the steps and see how they apply and then um, uh, I will um, post the answers and a little while later okay and uh, and then you can contact me with any questions so it's it's not as complex as you think there's a process to it. thank you